Okay, so we have seen that Paul Grice, unlike uh, Gottlob Frege, is interested in contextual meaning, not interested in context-free meaning, but contextual meaning. He's interested in pragmatics rather than semantics. In his um, short but crucial and important article, Meaning, Paul Grice, two kinds of senses of the phrase to mean, or the phrase means something, or the phrase means that. This phrase can be taken in two different ways. And the two different ways in which it can be taken, Grice calls natural meaning versus non-natural meaning. Natural meaning, he also calls indicator meaning, and non-natural meaning he also calls communicative meaning. So that gives away already what non-natural meaning is about. It doesn't have to do with nature, it doesn't have to do with things in the world, but rather, well, things in, in, in um, nature apart from humans, but rather it has to do with, um, with communication. So, Let's start with natural meaning. That's the kind of meaning um, that something has when it is a natural and a reliable sign or a symptom or evidence for something. So natural meaning rests on a law-like relationship in the world. Let's look at the examples. Those spots mean measles. Now, for this term means to be properly used in this sentence, it has to be the case that a person couldn't have those particular spots on the skin without having measles. So the spots must be characteristic. In fact, they have to be unique for measles. That's the idea. So if and when that's the case, you couldn't have those spots unless you had measles, then it's correct to say the spots mean measles. Black clouds mean rain. Same thing. There's a natural relation between black clouds and rain. And so we rely on this natural relation when saying black clouds mean rain. Or uh, these tracks mean that a deer has been here. So tracks, as we all know, are characteristic of the size of the animal, the shape of the hoof, and all that. So you can tell which animal has been there at a particular spot, given, on the, given the tracks. So the tracks are a reliable sign for the presence of an animal, just as the black clouds are for the rain, or the spots for the measles. But these are all natural relations. That's why it's called natural meaning. That is, they do not rely on any conventions on our part. They do not rely on the intention of the speaker. These are just natural relations. Um, another one would be the relation between the, the, the rings on a tree trunk and the age of the tree that has been cut. That's a natural relation, quite independent of speakers' intentions and conventions. The last example here is the recent budget means that we'll have a hard year. So the budget shows, you know, what's coming in, what's going out, and if the budget looks really bad, then you know the coming months are going to be financially difficult. There's a natural relation between shortage of money and, you know, budgetary difficulties ahead of Compare that with non-natural meaning. That's the kind of meaning that is distinctive of linguistic expressions and communication. And Grice, Paul Grice, distinguishes two types of non-natural meaning. There's conventional meaning, that is how terms are standardly used, or conventionally used, or... And then there is speaker meaning. Speaker meaning has to do with how an individual speaker in a particular context intends to use a certain expression. The examples that Paul Grice gives us are the, as follows. Those three rings on the bell 
of the bus mean that the bus is full? So that's a convention. Three rings mean the bus is full. It's a convention we could instead have four bells mean that the bus is full. But that's a convention, so it's not a natural meaning that the three rings have. It's a conventional one. Tom meant that the stranger should get off his foot. So probably Tom meant that by shoving off the stranger from his foot or by saying, please get off my foot. Whatever Tom did, he did what he did meant what it did because of either Tom's intentions or because he used a conventional sign. The light atop a taxi being on means that the taxi is available. Conventional sign. We could change the convention. We could say the light being off means that the taxi is available. What matters here is that this is a conventional meaning that the, the, the light being on has. It's not a natural meaning. And the last example goes back to the last mini lecture. Alvin meant that Jones is academically weak when he wrote Jones has beautiful handwriting. So Alvin meant that in the sense of not the phrase being a natural sign for Jones being academically weak, but rather he meant it in the sense of trying to convey to the reader in a polite way that Jones is not very good academically. So this is a non-natural meaning. That distinction is important. Grice makes the distinction at the beginning of his article because he wants to um, only talk about non-natural meaning. He basically wants to get natural meaning out of the way. He presents a theory of non-natural meaning. In addition to giving us the distinction between natural and non-natural meaning, uh, Paul Grice also gives us two tests for non-natural meaning. That is, two tests that we can apply in case we are unsure is that an instance of natural or of non-natural meaning. In the cases of natural meaning, X means P, that's the phrase, entails P. Entailment, remember, that's a term we came across in the very first lecture on arguments. X entails P if there is a deductively valid argument from X to P. In our context, what we need to remember, if X entails P, then if X is present is the case, P must be the case. So X guarantees the truth of P. Think back to the measles example. If the spots mean measles in the sense of natural meaning, then you couldn't have the spots unless you have measles. So the spots are a reliable sign of, the, of measles, of the illness that they are a sign for. So in the case of non-natural meaning, error is impossible. There is a, a guarantee of um, the sign and what it is a sign for. That's not the case with non-natural meaning. Think again about the bus example. Those three rings on the bell mean that the bus is full. But now we can go on and say, but the bus, bus is not full. The conductor has made a mistake. No problem whatsoever. The three rings standardly mean that the bus is full, but the three rings can mean what they mean, and we can still have the thing that they are assigned for not be the case. That is, the bus may not be full after all. The conductor has um, miscounted, has, over, has overlooked that there are one or two seats still available. So natural meaning is a reliable sign. Non-natural meaning need not be reliable. Error is possible. That's one difference or one test to see whether some particular uh, occurrence of the term mean is natural or non-natural. Here's another one, quotation. In the case of natural meaning, the verb to mean cannot be followed by a quotation. That is a phrase in inverted commas. 
In the case of non-natural meaning, however, that is possible. Again, our examples, those spots mean he has measles. Now that's incorrect. In fact, that's, that's wrong. I mean, that's awfully wrong. Why? Well, what the spots mean is not the phrase that he has measles. What the spots mean is that the, the person has measles. But they don't mean a phrase. But now compare that with the three rings on the bell mean the bus is full. That's absolutely correct. Why? Well, what the three bells mean, the three rings on the bell mean, is the same thing as if the conductor turned around and shouted out, the bus is full. That's what the three rings uh, on the bell mean. So the three rings mean the same thing as the sentence, the bus is full. So the three rings mean a sentence. The spots don't mean a sentence. The spots mean the person has measles. No quotation marks. So this is yet another way to distinguish natural from non-natural meaning. As I said, Grice starts out by um, drawing the dis distinction between natural and non-natural meaning. He's only interested in non-natural meaning. And as I mentioned, there are two kinds of non-natural meaning, conventional and speaker meaning. Um, often the conventional meaning of an utterance and what the speaker means in uttering it are one and the same. That's often the case, but it need not be the case. And the examples I've given where conventional meaning and speaker meaning come apart are the examples I've already um, given in the previous lecture are irony, sarcasm, and metaphors can also be used here. So um, if I say Alvin is so primitive, he could regenerate missing limbs. Of course, this is not very nice to say. It's sarcastic. But you instantly understand what I mean. You understand that I try to say that Alvin is really not very intelligent. Um, so the term primitive, and or the whole sentence, in fact, uh, needs to be taken in a certain context, the context that the speaker has, uh, the, the, the context in which the speaker makes it. And so whatever meaning that phrase has, it has because you pick up on the intention of the speaker when making the utterance. So it has speaker's meaning. Now look at a metaphor. Um, Susan uh, drowned in a sea of grief. That statement has conventional meaning. You don't really need to know much about the person who uttered the sentence uh, and the gesture that the person made when uttering the sentence. That sentence has meaning. The meaning is different from the literal meaning. There's no sea. Um, Susan didn't actually drown. So no literal meaning. It has uh, conventional meaning that is different from literal meaning, but uh, its non-natural meaning is of a conventional type, not specific to a, a particular occurrence of utterance. So Grice thinks that speaker meaning is actually more basic than conventional meaning. He thinks speaker meaning is the most conventional, and what his paper, uh, his short paper is um, is purporting to do is to give an account of speaker meaning.